privateer. For other uses, see privateer, disambiguation. East Indiaman Kent Battling Confians, a privateer vessel commanded by French corsair Robert Surcouf in October 1800, as depicted in a painting by Ambrose Louis Garneret. A privateer or corsair was a private person or ship authorized by a government by letters of mark to attack foreign vessels during wartime. Privateering was a way of mobilizing armed ships and sailors without having to spend treasury resources or commit naval officers. They were of great benefit to a smaller naval power or one facing an enemy dependent on trade, they disrupted commerce and pressured the enemy to deploy warships to protect merchant trade against commerce raiders. The cost was borne by investors hoping to profit from prize money earned from captured cargo and vessels. The proceeds would be distributed among the privateers' investors, officers, and crew. Privateers were part of naval warfare from the 16th to the 19th centuries. Some privateers have been particularly influential in the annals of history. Sometimes the vessels would be commissioned into regular service as warships. The crew of a privateer might be treated as prisoners of war by the enemy country if captured. Historically, the distinction between a privateer and a pirate has been, practically speaking, vague, often depending on the source as to which label was correct in a particular circumstance. 1. The actual work of a pirate and a privateer is generally the same, raiding and plundering ships. It is, therefore, the authorization and perceived legality of the actions that form the distinction. At various times, governments indiscriminately granted authorization for privateering to a variety of ships, so much so that would-be pirates could easily operate under a veil of legitimacy. Legal Framework Main Article, Paris Declaration Respecting Maritime Law Being privately owned and run, privateers did not take orders from the naval command. The letter of mark of a privateer would typically limit activity to a specific area and to the ships of specific nations. Typically, the owners or captain would be required to post a performance bond against breaching these conditions, or they might be liable to pay damages to an injured party. In the United Kingdom, letters of mark were revoked for various offenses. Boarding of the Triton, a British East Indiaman, by the French Corsair Hazard. Conditions on board privateers varied widely. Some crews were treated as harshly as naval crews of the time, while others followed the comparatively relaxed rules of merchant ships. Some crews were made up of professional merchant seamen, others of pirates, debtors, and convicts. Some privateers ended up becoming pirates, not just in the eyes of their enemies, but also of their own nations. William Kidd, for instance, began as a legitimate British privateer but was later hanged for piracy. The Paris Declaration Respecting Maritime Law of April 16, 1856 was issued to abolish privateering. It regulated the relationship between neutral and belligerent and shipping on the high seas introducing new prize rules, too. Ships Entrepreneurs converted many different types of vessels into privateers, including obsolete warships and refitted merchant ships. The investors would arm the vessels and recruit large crews, much larger than a merchantman or a naval vessel would carry, in order to crew the prizes they captured. Privateers generally cruised independently, but it was not unknown for them to form squadrons or to cooperate with the regular navy. A number of privateers were part of the English fleet that opposed the Spanish Armada in 1588. Privateers generally avoided encounters with warships, as such encounters would be at best unprofitable. Still, such encounters did occur. For instance, in 1815 Chasseur encountered HMS St. Lawrence, herself a former American privateer, mistaking her for a merchantman until too late, in this instance, the privateer prevailed. The United States used mixed squadrons of frigates and privateers in the American Revolutionary War. Following the French Revolution, French privateers became a menace to British and American shipping in the Western Atlantic and the Caribbean, resulting in the Quasi-War, a brief conflict between France and the United States, fought largely at sea, 
and to the Royal Navy's procuring Bermuda sloops to combat the French privateers. 3. Overall History 16th century trade routes prey to privateering. Spanish treasure fleets linking the Caribbean to Seville, Manila Acapulco galleons started in 1568, white, and rival Portuguese India armadas of 1498-1640, blue. England, and later the United Kingdom, used privateers to great effect and suffered much from other nations' privateering. During the 15th century, piracy became an increasing problem and merchant communities such as Bristol began to resort to self-help, arming and equipping ships at their own expense to protect commerce. 4. These privately owned merchant ships, licensed by the Crown, could legitimately take vessels that were deemed pirates. This constituted a revolution in naval strategy and helped fill the need for protection that the current administration was unable to provide as it lacked an institutional structure and coordinated finance. 5. 6. The, the increase in competition for crews on armed merchant vessels and privateers was due, in a large part, because of the chance for a considerable payoff. Whereas a seaman who shipped on a naval vessel was paid a wage and provided with victuals, the mariner on a merchantman or privateer was paid with an agreed share of the takings. 5. This proved to be a far more attractive prospect and privateering flourished as a result. During Queen Elizabeth's reign, she encouraged the development of this supplementary navy. 7. Over the course of her rule, she had allowed Anglo-Spanish relations to deteriorate to the point where one could argue that a war with the Spanish was inevitable. 8. By using privateers, if the Spanish were to take offense at the plundering of their ships, Queen Elizabeth could always deny she had anything to do with the actions of such independents. Some of the most famous privateers that later fought in the Anglo-Spanish War, 1585-1604, included the Sea Dogs. In the late 16th century, English ships cruised in the Caribbean and off the coast of Spain, trying to intercept treasure fleets from the Spanish main. At this early stage the idea of a regular navy, the Royal Navy, as distinct from the Merchant Navy, was not present, so there is little to distinguish the activity of English privateers from regular naval warfare. Attacking Spanish ships, even during peacetime, was part of a policy of military and economic competition with Spain which had been monopolizing the maritime trade routes along with the Portuguese helping to provoke the First Anglo-Spanish War, citation needed. Capturing a Spanish treasure ship would enrich the crown as well as strike a practical blow against Spanish domination of America. Magnus Heinesen was one privateer who served the Dutch against the Spanish. While his and others' attacks brought home a great deal of money, they hardly dented the flow of gold and silver from Mexico to Spain. Elizabeth was succeeded by the first Stuart monarchs, James I and Charles I, who did not permit privateering. There were a number of unilateral and bilateral declarations limiting privateering between 1785 and 1823. However, the breakthrough came in 1856 when the Declaration of Paris, signed by all major European powers, stated that privateering is and remains abolished. The USA did not sign because a stronger amendment, protecting all private property from capture at sea, was not accepted. In the 19th century, many nations passed laws forbidding their nationals from accepting commissions as privateers for other nations. The last major power to flirt with privateering was Prussia in the 1870 Franco-Prussian War, when Prussia announced the creation of a volunteer navy of ships privately owned and manned and eligible for prize money. The only difference between this and privateering was that these volunteer ships were under the discipline of the regular navy. CSS Savannah, a Confederate privateer 17th, 18th and 19th centuries Privateers were a large part of the total military force at sea during the 17th and 18th centuries. In the First Anglo-Dutch War, English privateers attacked the trade on which the United Provinces entirely depended, capturing over 1,000 Dutch merchant ships. During the subsequent war with Spain, Spanish and Flemish privateers in the service of the Spanish Crown, including the notorious Dunkirkers, captured 1,500 English merchant ships, helping to restore Dutch international trade. 9. British trade 
whether coastal, Atlantic, or Mediterranean, was also attacked by Dutch privateers and others in the Second and Third Anglo-Dutch Wars. During King George's War, approximately 36,000 Americans served aboard privateers at one time or another. 10. During the Nine Years' War, the French adopted a policy of strongly encouraging privateers, including the famous Jean Bart, to attack English and Dutch shipping. England lost roughly 4,000 merchant ships during the war. 10. In the following war of Spanish succession, privateer attacks continued, Britain losing 3,250 merchant ships. 11. Parliament passed an updated Cruisers and Convoys Act in 1708 allocating regular warships to the defense of trade. In the subsequent conflict, the War of Austrian Succession, the Royal Navy was able to concentrate more on defending British ships. Britain lost 3,238 merchantmen, a smaller fraction of her merchant marine than the enemy losses of 3, 4, 34, 10, while French losses were proportionally severe. The smaller but better protected Spanish trade suffered the least and it was Spanish privateers who enjoyed much of the best allied plunder of British trade, particularly in the West Indies. During the American Civil War privateering took on several forms, including blockade running while privateering in general occurred in the interests of both the North and the South. Letters of mark would often be issued to private shipping companies and other private owners of ships authorizing them to engage vessels deemed to be unfriendly to the issuing government. Crews of ships were awarded the cargo and other prizes aboard any captured vessel as an incentive to search far and wide for ships attempting to supply the Confederacy, or aid the Union, as the case may be. Britain Woods Rogers' men search Spanish ladies for their jewels in Guayaquil, Ecuador, 1709. England and Scotland separately and together after they united to create the Kingdom of Great Britain in 1707, practiced privateering. It was a way to gain for themselves some of the wealth the Spanish and Portuguese were taking from the New World before beginning their own transatlantic settlement, and a way to assert naval power before a strong Royal Navy emerged. Sir Andrew Barton, Lord High Admiral of Scotland, followed the example of his father, who had been issued with letters of mark by James III of Scotland to prey upon English and Portuguese shipping in 1485, the letters in due course were reissued to the Sun. Barton was killed following an encounter with the English in 1511. Sir Francis Drake, who had close contact with the Sovereign, was responsible for some damage to Spanish shipping, as well as attacks on Spanish settlements in the Americas in the 16th century. He participated in the successful English defense against the Spanish Armada in 1588, though he was also partly responsible for the failure of the English Armada against Spain in 1589. Sir George Clifford, 3rd Earl of Cumberland, was a successful privateer against Spanish shipping in the Caribbean. He is also famous for his short-lived 1598 capture of Fort San Felipe del Moro, the citadel protecting San Juan, Puerto Rico. He arrived in Puerto Rico on June 15, 1598, but by November of that year Clifford and his men had fled the island due to fierce civilian resistance. He gained sufficient prestige from his naval exploits to be named the official champion of Queen Elizabeth I. Clifford became extremely wealthy through his buccaneering, but lost most of his money gambling on horse races. An action between an English ship and vessels of the Barbary Corsairs. Captain Christopher Newport led more attacks on Spanish shipping and settlements than any other English privateer. As a young man, Newport sailed with Sir Francis Drake in the attack on the Spanish fleet at Cadiz and participated in England's defeat of the Spanish Armada. During the war with Spain, Newport seized fortunes of Spanish and Portuguese treasure in fierce sea battles in the West Indies as a privateer for Queen Elizabeth I. In 1592, Newport captured the Portuguese Carrick Madre de Deus, Mother of God, valued at £500,000. Sir Henry Morgan was a successful privateer. Operating out of Jamaica, he carried on a war against Spanish interests in the region, often using cunning tactics. 
His operation was prone to cruelty against those he captured, including torture to gain information about booty, and in one case using priests as human shields. Despite reproaches for some of his excesses, he was generally protected by Sir Thomas Modiford, the governor of Jamaica. He took an enormous amount of booty, as well as landing his privateers ashore and attacking land fortifications, including the sack of the city of Panama with only 1,400 crew, citation needed. Other British privateers of note include Fortunatus Wright, Edward Collier, Sir John Hawkins, his son Sir Richard Hawkins, Michael Gear, and Sir Christopher Mynges. Notable British colonial privateers in Nova Scotia include Alexander Godfrey of the Brig Rover and Joseph Bars of the schooner Liverpool Packet. The latter schooner captured over 50 American vessels during the War of 1812. Spain and its colonies Miguel Enriquez When Spain issued a decree blocking foreign countries from trading, selling, or buying merchandise in its Caribbean colonies, the entire region became engulfed in a power struggle among the naval superpowers. 12. The newly independent United States later became involved in this scenario, complicating the conflict. 12. As a consequence, Spain increased the issuing of privateering contracts. 12. These contracts allowed an income option to the inhabitants of these colonies that were not related to the Spanish conquistadores. The most notable example is Miguel Enriquez, a Puerto Rican mulatto who abandoned his work as a shoemaker to work as a privateer. Such was the success of Enriquez that he became one of the wealthiest men in the New World. Bermudians File Bermuda Sloop Privateer.jpg A Bermuda Sloop engaged as a privateer. The English colony of Bermuda, or the Summers Isles, settled accidentally in 1609, turned from a failed agricultural economy to the sea after the 1684 dissolution of the Summers Isles Company. With a total area of 21 square miles, 54 square kilometers, and lacking any natural resources other than the Bermuda Cedar, the colonists applied themselves fully to the maritime trades, developing the speedy Bermuda Sloop, which was well suited both to commerce and to commerce raiding. Bermudian merchant vessels turned to privateering at every opportunity in the 18th century, preying on the shipping of Spain, France, and other nations during a series of wars, including the 1688-1697 Nine Years' War, King William's War, the 1702-1713 Queen Anne's War Wink with a Frown 13, 14, the 1739-1748 War of Jenkins' Ear, the 1740-1748 War of the Austrian Succession, King George's War, the 1754-1763 Seven Years' War, known in North America as the French and Indian War. This conflict was devastating for the colony's merchant fleet. Fifteen privateers operated from Bermuda during the war, but losses exceeded captures, the 1775-1783. American War of Independence and the 1796-1808 Anglo-Spanish War, 15, 16, by the middle of the 18th century, Bermuda was sending twice as many privateers to sea as any of the continental colonies. They typically left Bermuda with very large crews. This advantage in manpower was vital in overpowering the crews of larger vessels, which themselves often lacked sufficient crew members to put up a strong defense. The extra crewmen were also useful as prize crews for returning captured vessels. The Bahamas, which had been depopulated of its indigenous inhabitants by the Spanish, had been settled by England, beginning with the Eleutheran adventurers, dissident Puritans driven out of Bermuda during the English Civil War. Spanish and French attacks destroyed New Providence in 1703, creating a stronghold for pirates, and it became a thorn in the side of British merchant trade through the area. In 1718, Britain appointed Woods Rogers as governor of the Bahamas and sent him at the head of a force to reclaim the settlement. Before his arrival, however, the pirates had been forced to surrender by a force of Bermudian privateers who had been issued letters of mark by the governor of Bermuda. File, Bermuda Gazette, 12 November 1796.jpg Bermuda Gazette of November 12, 
1796, calling for privateering against Spain and its allies during the 1796-1808 Anglo-Spanish War, and with advertisements for crew for two privateer vessels. Bermuda was in de facto control of the Turks' islands, with their lucrative salt industry, from the late 17th century to the early 19th. The Bahamas made perpetual attempts to claim the Turks for itself. On several occasions, this involved seizing the vessels of Bermudian salt traders. A virtual state of war was said to exist between Bermudian and Bahamian vessels for much of the 18th century. When the Bermudian sloop Seaflower was seized by the Bahamians in 1701, the response of Bermuda Governor Bennett was to issue letters of marque to Bermudian vessels. In 1706, Spanish and French forces ousted the Bermudians, but were driven out themselves three years later by the Bermudian privateer Captain Louis Middleton. His ship, the Rose, attacked a Spanish and a French privateer holding a captive English vessel. Defeating the two enemy vessels, the Rose then cleared out the 30-man garrison left by the Spanish and French, 17. Despite strong sentiments in support of the rebels, especially in the early stages, Bermudian privateers turned as aggressively on American shipping during the American War of Independence. The importance of privateering to the Bermudian economy had been increased not only by the loss of most of Bermuda's continental trade, but also by the Palliser Act, which forbade Bermudian vessels from fishing the Grand Banks. Bermudian trade with the rebellious American colonies actually carried on throughout the war. Some historians credit the large number of Bermuda sloops, reckoned at over a thousand, built in Bermuda as privateers and sold illegally to the Americans as enabling the rebellious colonies to win their independence. 18. Also, the Americans were dependent on Turk salt, and 100 barrels of gunpowder were stolen from a Bermudian magazine and supplied to the rebels at the request of George Washington in exchange for which the Continental Congress authorized the sale of supplies to Bermuda, which was dependent on American produce. The realities of this interdependence did nothing to dampen the enthusiasm with which Bermudian privateers turned on their erstwhile countrymen. An American naval captain, ordered to take his ship out of Boston Harbor to eliminate a pair of Bermudian privateering vessels that had been picking off vessels missed by the Royal Navy, returned frustrated, saying, the Bermudians sailed their ships two feet for every one of ours. 19. Around 10,000 Bermudians emigrated in the years prior to American independence, mostly to the American colonies. Many Bermudians occupied prominent positions in American seaports, from where they continued their maritime trades, Bermudian merchants controlled much of the trade through ports like Charleston, South Carolina, and Bermudian shipbuilders influenced the development of American vessels, like the Chesapeake Bay Schooner, comma, 15, 20, 21, and in the Revolution they used their knowledge of Bermudians and of Bermuda, as well as their vessels, for the rebels' cause. In the 1777, Battle of Wreck Hill, a pair of Bermudian-born brothers, 22, captaining two sloops, carried out the only attack on Bermuda during the war. The target was a fort that guarded a little-used passage through the encompassing reef line. After the soldiers manning the fort were forced to abandon it, they spiked its guns and fled themselves before reinforcements could arrive. 23. When the Americans captured the Bermudian privateer Regulator, they discovered that virtually all of her crew were black slaves. Authorities in Boston offered these men their freedom, but all 70 elected to be treated as prisoners of war. Sent as such to New York on the sloop Duxbury, they seized the vessel and sailed it back to Bermuda, 24. The American War of 1812 saw an encore of Bermudian privateering, which had died out after the 1790s. The decline of Bermudian privateering was due partly to the buildup of the naval base in Bermuda, which reduced the Admiralty's reliance on privateers in the Western Atlantic, and partly to successful American legal suits and claims for damages pressed against British privateers, a large portion of which were aimed squarely at the Bermudians. 25. During the course of the American War of 1812, Bermudian privateers captured 298 ships, 
some 19% of the 1,593 vessels captured by British naval and privateering vessels between the Great Lakes and the West Indies, 26. Amongst the better-known, native-born and immigrant, Bermudian privateers were Hezekiah Frith, Bridger Goodrich, 27, Henry Jennings, Thomas Hewitson, 28, and Thomas II. French Corsairs in 1806 taking prizes and British prisoners. France Main article, French Corsairs Corsairs, French, Corsair, were privateers authorized to conduct raids on shipping of a nation at war with France, on behalf of the French crown. Seized vessels and cargo were sold at auction, with the Corsair captain entitled to a portion of the proceeds. Although not French Navy personnel, Corsairs were considered legitimate combatants in France and allied nations, provided the commanding officer of the vessel was in possession of a valid letter of marque, FR Lettre de Marque or Lettre de Corse, and the officers and crew conducted themselves according to contemporary admiralty law. By acting on behalf of the French crown, if captured by the enemy, they could claim treatment as prisoners of war, instead of being considered pirates. Because corsairs gained a swashbuckling reputation, the word corsair is also used generically as a more romantic or flamboyant way of referring to privateers, or even to pirates. The Barbary pirates of North Africa, as well as Ottomans were sometimes called Turkish Corsairs. United States Pride of Baltimore II, replica United States topsail schooner, favored by privateers for its speed and ability to sail close to the wind. During the American Revolutionary War, the Continental Congress and some state governments, on their own initiative, issued privateering licenses, authorizing legal piracy, to merchant captains in an effort to take prizes from the British Navy and Tory, Loyalist, privateers. This was done due to the relatively small number of commissioned American naval vessels and the pressing need for prisoner exchange. About 55,000 American seamen served aboard the privateers, 29, they quickly sold their prizes, dividing their profits with the financier, persons or company, and the state, colony. Long Island Sound became a hornet's nest of privateering activity during the American Revolution, 1775 to 1783, as most transports to and from New York went through the Sound. New London, Connecticut was a chief privateering port for the American colonies, leading to the British Navy blockading it in 1778 to 1779. Chief financiers of privateering included Thomas and Nathaniel Shaw of New London and John McCurdy of Lyme. In the months before the British raid on New London and Groton, a New London privateer took Hannah in what is regarded as the largest prize taken by any American privateer during the war. Retribution was likely part of Governor Clinton's, New York, motivation for Arnold's raid, as the Hannah had carried many of his most cherished items. Naval Battle Off Halifax, Nova Scotia American privateers are thought to to have seized up to 300 British ships during the war. One of the more successful of these ships was the Prince de Neuchâtel, which once captured nine British prizes in swift succession in the English Channel. Citation needed, the British shipjack was captured and turned into an American privateer, only to be captured again by the British in the naval battle off Halifax, Nova Scotia. American privateers not only fought naval battles but also raided numerous communities in British colonies such as the raid on Lunenburg, Nova Scotia, 1782. The United States Constitution authorized the U.S. Congress to grant letters of mark and reprisal. Between the end of the Revolutionary War and 1812, less than 30 years, Britain, France, Naples, the Barbary States, Spain, and the Netherlands seized approximately 2,500 American ships, 30, Payments in ransom and tribute to the Barbary states amounted to 20% of United States government annual revenues in 1831, and would lead the United States to fight the Barbary states in the First Barbary War and Second Barbary Wars. During the War of 1812, the British attacked Essex, Connecticut, and burned the ships in the harbor, due to the construction there of a number of privateers. 
This was the greatest financial loss of the entire War of 1812 suffered by the Americans. However, the private fleet of James de Wolfe, which sailed under the flag of the American government in 1812, was most likely a key factor in the naval campaign of the war. De Wolfe's ship, the Yankee, was possibly the most financially successful ship of the war. Privateers proved to be far more successful than their U.S. Navy counterparts, claiming three quarters of the 1,600 British merchant ships taken during the war, although a third of these were recaptured prior to making landfall. Whilst apparently successful, the privateer campaign was ultimately a failure. British convoy systems honed during the Napoleonic Wars limited losses to singleton ships, and the effective blockade of American and continental ports prevented captured ships being taken in for sale. This ultimately led to orders forbidding U.S. privateers from attempting to bring their prizes into port, with captured ships instead having to be burnt. Over 200 American privateer ships were captured by the Royal Navy, many of which were turned on their former owners and used by the British blockading forces. James de Wolfe The U.S. was not one of the initial signatories of the 1856 Declaration of Paris which outlawed privateering, and the Confederate Constitution authorized use of privateers. However, the USA did offer to adopt the terms of the Declaration during the American Civil War, when the Confederates sent several privateers to sea before putting their main effort in the more effective commissioned raiders. During the Civil War Confederate President Jefferson Davis issued letters of mark to anyone who would employ their ship to either attack Union shipping or bring badly needed supplies through the Union blockade into southern ports. Many of the supplies brought into the Confederacy were carried aboard privately owned vessels. When word came about that the Confederacy was willing to pay almost any price for military supplies various interested parties designed and built specially designed lightweight seagoing steamers, blockade runners specifically designed and built to outrun Union ships on blockade patrol, 32-33. No letter of mark has been legitimately issued by the United States since the 19th century. The status of submarine hunting Goodyear airships in the early days of the Second World War has created significant confusion. According to one story, the United States Navy issued a letter of mark to the airship Resolute on the west coast of the United States at the beginning of World War II, making it the first time the U.S. Navy commissioned a privateer since the War of 1812-34, however, this story, along with various other accounts referring to the airship's resolute and volunteer as operating under a privateer status, is highly dubious. Since neither the Congress nor the President appears to have authorized a privateer during the war, the Navy would not have had the authority to do so by itself. 35. Latin America Main Article, Insurgent Privateer Corsario, Privateer by Mexican artist Mauricio Garcia Vega. Warships were recruited by the insurgent governments during Spanish-American Wars of Independence to destroy Spanish trade and capture Spanish merchant vessels. The private armed vessels came largely from the United States. Seamen from Britain, United States, and France often manned these ships. See also References Kleinen, John, Oswiger, Menon, ed., 2010. Pirates, Ports, and Coasts in Asia, Historical and Contemporary Perspectives. Institute of Southeast Asian Studies. P. 15. ISBN 978-9814279079. Donald E. Schmidt. The Folly of War, American Foreign Policy. 1898 to 2005, 2005, ISBN 0-87586-382-5. Pete 75. Bermuda Gazette and Weekly Advertiser August 15, 1795. Lodes, D. M. The Making of the Elizabethan Navy, 1540 to 1590, From the Solent to the Armada. Woodbridge, Boydell, 2009. P.3. Jump up to 5.05.1 loads, D. M. The Making of the Elizabethan Navy, 1540 to 1590, 
from the Solent to the Armada. Woodbridge, Boydell, 2009. P.53. Loads, D. M. The Making of the Elizabethan Navy, 1540-1590, from the Solent to the Armada. Woodbridge, Boydell, 2009. P.1. Loads, D. M. The Making of the Elizabethan Navy, 1540-1590, from the Solent to the Armada. Woodbridge, Boydell, 2009. P.121. Loads, D. M. The Making of the Elizabethan Navy, 1540-1590, from the Solent to the Armada. Woodbridge, Boydell, 2009. P.113. Spanish Privateers. Jump up to 10.010.110.2 Privateering and the Private Production of Naval Power, Gary M. Anderson and Adam Gifford Jr. Brewer, John. The Sinews of Power, War, Money, and the English State, 1688-1783. New York, Alfred A. Knopf, 1989. P.197. Jump up, up to 12.012.112.2 Carmen Dolores Trellis, January 9, 1991. En busca de cofrazi, in Spanish. El Nuevo Día. HTTP colon slash slash www.adendi.com slash archivio.asp question mark number equal sign 39187 ampersand year equal sign 1991 ampersand month equal sign 1 ampersand keyword equal sign. Retrieved November 12, 2013. Cedar on the Reef, Scholarship. East Carolina University, PDF. Cedar Cedar on the Reef, Archaeological and Historical Assessments of the 18th Century Bermuda Sloop, Exemplified by the Wreck of the Hunter Galley, by James Christopher Welliver Southerly, East Carolina University, ECU. University Libraries, UNCG. Jump up to 15.015.1 in the Eye of All Trade, Bermuda, Bermudians, and the Maritime Atlantic World, 1680-1783, by Michael Jarvis, University of North Carolina Press, Chapel Hill, 2010. Bermuda's Sailors of Fortune, by Sister Jean de Chantal Kennedy. Bermuda Historical Society, January 1, 1963. ASIN-B0007J8WMW. Maritimes, the magazine of the Bermuda Maritime Museum. 2002. Volume 15, Number 2. Foreign Interlopers at Bermuda's Turks Islands, by Dr. Bill Cook. The Bermudian, Bermuda in the Privateering Business, by Lt. Col. Gavin Shorto. Bermudiana, by Ronald John Williams. Reinhardt and Company, Inc., 1946. Tidewater Triumph. The Development and Worldwide Success of the Chesapeake Bay Pilot Schooner, by Jeffrey Futner. Schiffer Publishing. May 1, 1998. ISBN 0870335111. ISBN 978-0870335112. The Exodus, by Michael Jarvis. The Bermudian Magazine, June 2001. Bermuda from Sail to Steam, The History of the Island from 1784 to 1901, Dr. Henry Wilkinson, Oxford, Oxford University Press. Bernouz, 1777, The U.S. Navy and the Battle of Wreck Hill. Maritime Masters and Seafaring Slaves in Bermuda, 1680 to 1783, by Michael J. Jarvis. The Jefferson Library. Bermuda from Sail to Steam, The History of the Island from 1784 to 1901, Dr. Henry Wilkinson, Oxford University Press, ISBN 0-19-215932-1. The Andrew and the Onions, The Story of the Royal Navy in Bermuda, 1795-1975, Lieutenant Commander Ian Stranach, 
The Bermuda Maritime Museum Press, The Bermuda Maritime Museum, P.O. Box MA-133, Mangrove Bay, Bermuda MABX. ISBN 0-921560-03-6. The Prince of Privateers, Bridger Goodrich and his family in America, Bermuda, and Britain, 1775-1825, by Nick Hartley. M. and M. Baldwin, September 1, 2012. ISBN 094-771-2518. ISBN 978-0947712518. Bermuda in the Privateering Business, by Colonel Gavin Shorto. The Bermudian Magazine, Winter 2010. Privateers or Merchant Mariners Help Win the Revolutionary War. U.S. Navy Fleet List War of 1812. Oren, Michael B., November 3, 2005. The Middle East and the Making of the United States, 1776-1815 http colon slash slash www.columbia.edu slash cu slash news slash zero five slash one one slash michaelorin.html Retrieved February 18th, 2007 Cooper, 2001 p.366 Coulter, 1950 p.290 Shock and Smith, The Goodyear Airships, Airship International Press Pages 41 and 43, 1977. Theodore Richard, Reconsidering the Letter of Mark, Utilizing Private Security Providers Against Piracy, April 1, 2010. Public Contract Law Journal, Volume 39, Number 3, Pages 411 to 464 at 429 and 121, Spring 2010. Available at SSRN http colon slash slash ssrn dot com slash abstract equals sign one five nine one zero three nine bibliography cooper william j two thousand one jefferson davis american pages eight hundred and forty eight isbn zero dash three ninety four dash five six nine one six dash four url E. Merton Coulter, Louisiana State University Press, Coulter, Ellis Merton, 1994, 7th Printing, 1950. The Confederate States of America, 1861 to 1865. Pages 644. ISBN 0 8071 0007 2. URL. Further reading. Kagashal, George, 1856. History of the American Privateers and Letters of Mark. G. Kagashal, C. T. Evans, Agent. New York. Pages 438. URL. Faykert, Prize and Prejudice Privateering and Naval Prize in Atlantic Canada in the War of 1812. Research in Maritime History, Number 11. St. John's, NFLD, International Maritime Economic History Association, 1997. Nichols, A. O'Brien, Jr., Captain Christopher Newport, Admiral of Virginia, C. Venture, 2007. Smith, Joshua M. Battle for the Bay, The Naval War of 1812, Goose Lane Editions, Fredericton, N.B. 2011. Ross, Nicholas. The Provision of Naval Defense in the Early American Republic, A Comparison of the U.S. Navy and Privateers, 1789-1815. The Independent Review 16, No. 3, Winter, 2011. External Links